Hello there. In this lesson, we're going to learn about how crystal solids differ from each other. And so I have five examples representing the five different crystal types that we're going to look at. Now we're going to look at nonpolar molecules, like this candle wax. We're going to look at polar molecules, like this candy. We're going to look at ionic crystals, like this Himalayan salt. We're going to look at covalent network crystals. It's probably a new one to you, like this glass ball. And the last one are our metallic crystals. And we have a little gallium man here to represent that. So each one of those we're going to look at and compare the attractive forces and what makes them different from each other. So first of all, the word crystal is used here uh, to refer to a repeating pattern of bonds that you will find within these substances. So uh, we're not going to be looking at the other type, which is amorphous solids. Uh, a good example of the difference is the glass and these uh, marbles or this beaker are crystal that have uniform uh, bonding throughout the entire substance. And the sand, which is also the same compound, silicon dioxide, uh, is amorphous in that it doesn't have the same bonding. And so that's why it's more regular and doesn't uh, have the same properties as the crystal would. So our first group are going to be our nonpolar molecules. So uh, just a reminder about which molecules are nonpolar. They're the ones that have the similar electronegativity and a symmetrical shape. Uh, so all of our diatomic elements are going to be nonpolar because they have the same electronegativity and a symmetrical shape. Uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, anything with carbon and hydrogen is going to be a nonpolar molecule because carbon and hydrogen have uh, similar electronegativity and their shapes are generally symmetrical as well. And then the symmetrical molecules as well uh, from your Vesper training, you should be able to identify those are also going to be nonpolar uh, like this carbon tetrachloride or carbon dioxide. You can see that all the bonds inside would balance out, making that nonpolar. Alrighty, so if you have a crystal of something that's nonpolar, the way that it's held together is going to be all dispersion forces throughout the whole solid. It's going to be repeating dispersion forces over and over again. So in this glass here, you see a chunk of dry ice, which is solid carbon dioxide. And so throughout that solid, it's all dispersion forces holding one carbon dioxide molecule to another carbon dioxide molecule. And so you're going to have pretty low uh, boiling points, right? You can see this, uh, well, carbon dioxide just sublimates, goes straight to a gas uh, at a fairly low temperature. And, uh, and of course, if the molecule was bigger, you would, of course, have a stronger attraction there. And so you can have uh, nonpolar molecules that are solids at higher temperatures, but they're usually much larger molecules. You can think of things like candle wax in the original uh, um, slide that we looked at there. Uh, they don't conduct electricity very well. Uh, there's not a very easy way for an electron to get from one of these molecules to another, uh, so they're not conductors. Uh, and they don't dissolve in water very well, as you can see here, um, because they are not polar and the water is polar. A little recall for polar molecules. So polar molecules are those that have different electronegativities, right? So you keep an eye out for, you know, things with uh, you know, nitrogen, oxygen, halogens uh, that are very electronegative, and if it's bonded to something like carbon, uh, that will make it uh, polar because of the electronegativity difference. And also the asymmetrical shape will give you uh, polarity as well. And so you can see here that uh, this molecule is not symmetrical because you got a bunch of hydrogens on this side and fluorine, which is different on the other side, and so they don't really balance out. Uh, same thing here, you got and these lone pairs that um, make the shape non-symmetrical as well. And so just keep an eye out for those things and that'll give you a pretty big hint to whether or not you have a polar molecule. So molecular crystals that are polar will have different properties to ones that are nonpolar. Um, an example here of sugar versus wax. Um, you can see that the sugar um, has a higher melting and boiling point because it's very polar. The wax melted right away. Um, nonpolar, weaker attraction, didn't take as much heat to turn it into a liquid. Uh, another thing that you'll notice is that sugar dissolves really well in water because water is polar and so is the sugar but it'll just sit there in the bottom of a cup if you try to do it in something like oil, uh, which is nonpolar. 
so yeah, pol polar molecules dissolve in water very well or other um, polar solvents, whereas uh, it won't so much in something that's nonpolar. And they tend to have higher melting and boiling points than um, a molecule of similar size that was nonpolar. So our next crystal are the ionic crystals. We've been increasing in the intermolecular or interparticle force of attraction. And so ionic crystals have this very strong force of attraction of ionic bonds uh, between negative and positive ions. And that causes them to have a very high melting point. Uh, sodium chloride's melting point is around 800 degrees Celsius. Takes a lot of energy to pull these oppositely charged particles apart from each other. Um, if the charge is greater, then the amount of energy is going to be uh, more as well. So the melting point for magnesium oxide here, which has a plus two and a minus two charge, is a lot higher than for the table salt due to that extra charge between uh, those particles, those ions. Now these uh, solids um, as a crystal are fairly brittle. Uh, so if you hit them with a hammer, like a big salt crystal, it'll shatter into smaller pieces. They're pretty hard. You can scratch other things uh, easily with them. They don't conduct electricity very well. If you have a big salt crystal and you try to pass a charge through, it won't work very well. And again, that's because the electrons are stuck with their ions. All the electrons of the sodium are going to stay with the sodium. The electrons of the chlorine are going to stay with the chlorine and you can't get them to hop from one to another very easily. So non-conductive, brittle, hard, and high melting boiling points. The neat thing about ionic compounds, though, is if you can dissolve them in water or some other solvent, then the ions are mobile and they're free to move from one place to another. And so you can have, we don't have a power source here, but if you put a power source here, uh, electrons can then uh, attract particles, charge particles from one side, say this is the positive side and this is the negative side, and that'll allow charge to move uh, from one place to another and you know turn on your light bulb here uh, as the electrical charge can can move due to the movement of these ions uh, in the solution so the next uh, crystal that we're going to look at are the covalent network crystals and the keyword there is covalent uh, they have covalent bonds throughout the whole structure so they'll have a lattice work just like the ionic compounds, only it's covalent bonds that hold all these atoms together. Uh, that makes them the hardest because the covalent bonds are the hardest to break and they have the highest uh, melting and boiling points. Um, when you have more than one form of uh, covalent network, it's called an allotrope. And so there's a bunch of allotropes here for carbon. Uh, it's just a famous one to learn about. Uh, the crystalline allotropes are things like diamond that has this nice repeating pattern of carbon atoms in three dimensions. Uh, the other one you've probably heard of is graphite. Uh, graphite in your pencil will have these little sheets that can rub off one after another and that's how you write on a page. You can also run those sheets in strands in different directions and make yourself lightweight um, you know, hockey sticks and tennis rackets uh, with the graphite um, uh, strands going in opposite direction to give it its strength. Uh, you have some amorphous uh, representations of carbon as well. Uh, coke, which is used in like uh, coal-fired um, electrical generators, which hopefully you don't use as much anymore, but some places in the world still are. Just like a scrambled up version uh, where the covalent bonds don't have a nice regular pattern. Uh, charcoal, a little more regular, but still, um, still a bit of a mess, uh, both amorphous. Uh, think of anything super hard, and it's probably a covalent network. Uh, things like glass, or many rock formations um, have a covalent network uh, that gives them that property. Alrighty, our last type of crystal are our metals. Uh, now metals are put at the end here because the strength of attraction is variable. There are some metals with very strong attraction and very high melting points, but there's also ones you can probably think of like mercury that are liquid, so have a very weak attraction from one uh, metal uh, atom to another. Uh, so the variation comes from the way in which metals are held together. All metal atoms will give up electrons into this uh, shared area or C that can just sort of wash and move around in between all the cations of the metals uh, that donated them. And so these free electrons give metals their properties. Sometimes uh, these cations will be very strongly attracted 
to the other metals and you'll have things with very high melting points. Uh, I think the highest one is tungsten, which is the, uh, the element with the symbol W on the periodic table. Uh, which has a melting point that's in the thousands of degrees Celsius. And then, of course, you can think of mercury uh, being a liquid and has a very low melting point. Uh, so that attraction of the cations for these shared electrons is what holds them together and gives them that property. Now, there's other properties, too. Um, metals tend to be shiny, and it's because these free electrons will absorb and release the same uh, light uh, wavelength. And so that's why if you have a mirror or, uh, you know, chrome or any piece of metal and you polish it, uh, it will reflect light very well. Uh, conductivity, uh, electrons are very, con or sorry, the electrons in a metal are very conductive because they're free to move. And so if you put some electricity or heat in one side, it'll pretty easily move um, because of those uh, being transmitted on the vibration of the electrons from one place to another. And finally, um, malleability and ductility. This might have been a property you might have learned back in grade nine. Uh, malleable means you can shape it. Uh, and so if you hit uh, a metal with a hammer hard enough, there's my hammer, um, that, uh, oh, there we go. And, uh, put a handle on this hammer. Someone holding the hammer. There we go. Okay, so if you hit a metal with a hammer, you can move these cations down, change the shape of the metal, but the electrons, because they're so fluid, will move with it and hold uh, the substance all together. And so that makes uh, metals very bendy and malleable and also ductile, which means you can stretch it into wires, um, which is why um, our electrical circuits are all use wires. Uh, they conduct, they're very bendy, you can make wires out of them. This makes it very good uh, for those uses. Okay, so that's uh, all of your crystal solids. Um, hope you get some practice with them. We'll see you soon.